Limbo of the Lost is a 2007 point-and-click game that is infamous for being the single biggest case of plagiarism in gaming history. It contains plagiarized assets from countless popular games, movies, and other places, the most prominent of them being The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. The game was pulled from shelves when this was discovered, and the backlash from the gaming community resulted in its developers effectively vanishing off the face of the earth. In 2011, a now-defunct Swedish magazine called Fienden released their very first issue. It featured an article detailing how its writer, Johan Martinsson, managed to track down the developers and interview them on the details of the whole debacle. This video is going to be a reading of said article, which was first Google translated from Swedish into English and then proofread and edited so as to correct any glaring errors. The original Swedish text will be shown on the left, so please point out any cases of the translation being incorrect. All credit for the original article goes to Johan Martinsson. Since the story is being told from Johan's perspective, let me switch to a less elderly voice. All right, here we go. Part 1. The Lost When it was revealed, it was one of the biggest scandals in gaming history. Three friends from England had built a bad game by stealing material from many good ones and overnight became some of the most mocked, heckled, and hated people on the internet. Their story contains it all. Outrageous betrayals, deadly curses, crushed life dreams, friendships torn apart, and love relationships that come crashing down. It is a story of how a single game can make one lose everything. And here it is being told for the very first time. The project is more influenced by film and literature rather than other games. We want the experience to be as original as possible, and as such we have made a calculated effort to keep away from other games in the genre. Dear God, Steve Bovis. I can still, after everything that happened, lose my breath when I read the words he once chose to describe his Limbo of the Lost. Gaming site Quandryland.com asked the simple question, have any more recent games influenced your current project? And Steve Bovis responded with something really, really amazing. It wasn't just a lie. It was lying elevated to an art form. A lie so elaborate and death-defying, it was almost beautiful. A lie worthy of the devil. When the lie came into the world, there was no reason to even react to it. It was a pompous statement about a game no one ever heard of, uttered by a man no one cared about but such is common in the world we call gaming. Limbo of the Lost was a huge low-budget game created by three friends, Steve Bovis, Lawrence Francis, and Tim Croucher from the town of Maidstone in the southeast of England. And there was no reason at all to mention it in the same context as some higher arts. But what did it matter? Soon, we would all forget it. But time passed, things moved, and slowly, the lie, the writhing serpent that Steve Bovis unleashed into this world was approaching the moment where we could all see it for what it really was. Slowly, the spotlights moved towards Maidstone. Soon, the three friends would receive more attention than they had ever dreamed of. Soon, they would be on their knees, begging to be forgotten. Part 2. The Big Shock It's June 8, 2008, and Eric Frank is happy. He is 20 years old, lives at home with his parents in Edmonton, Canada, and for the very first time, he will be allowed to review a game. Becoming a game journalist is his big dream. And now, the little-known enthusiast website GamePlasma.com has agreed to let him review a little-known adventure that will soon hit stores. It's June 8, 2008, and when Eric Frank looks down in his mailbox, he sees not only a game, but also the symbol of everything he wants to achieve, which means that he will have a completely new beginning. He has no idea that he will instead cause the end of three people he has never met. But the moment when Limbo of the Lost ends up in Eric Frank's hands is also the moment when the truth, after 19 months of hunting, finally catches up with Steve Bovis. In that moment, the fate of the three friends is sealed. And then, it's just a matter of hours. Eric Frank installs Limbo of the Lost on his laptop. He starts playing, solves the opening puzzles, makes his way through the first two worlds, wonders why the backgrounds feel so dated, 
and finally ends up in a town called Darkmere. He wanders into the local town hall, and he can't believe his eyes. Not that there is anything special about Darkmere's town hall. On the contrary, it is just a hall with a stone floor, a large brown carpet, a chandelier on the ceiling, a staircase, a table, and a painted portrait of a man. It's just that Eric Frank has been there before. Back then, the place was called Castle Skingrad, and the game was called The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. But everything else is identical. The floor, the carpet, the chandelier on the ceiling, and the staircase. The man in the painting is the deceased emperor of the Oblivion world. Actually, the portrait depicts the Count of the Town of Skingrad, but still. Eric Frank has just exposed what later turns out to be one of the most extensive copyright infringements in history. He takes pictures and reports the find to his editor, who then posts an article on Game Plasma's front page, Limbo of the Lost or Oblivion. And then all hell breaks loose. Try Synergy, the game's American publisher, panics and pulls the game from store shelves, but by then it's already too late. The hordes of hardcore gamers that populate the internet have drawn blood, and it's thanks to them pouncing on the limbo of the lost like a pack of hungry predators that we know today how monumental Steve Bovis's lie was. It is thanks to them that we know that the three friends, despite their desire for the experience to feel as original as possible, had in fact stolen just about everything from everyone. They had stolen backgrounds from blockbuster games such as Return to Castle Wolfenstein, Painkiller, Enclave, The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, Thief Deadly Shadows, Unreal Tournament 2003 and 2004, and Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. They had stolen menus from World of Warcraft, Diablo II, Age of Wonders, and Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle-Earth. They had stolen from movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, Beetlejuice, and Spawn. They'd stolen from book covers and paper and pencil role-playing games. They'd even stolen the logo of a famous drugstore chain. They had stolen from giant companies like Electronic Arts, New Line Cinema, and Walt Disney. The whole game was a single monumental f you aimed at the very concept of intellectual property. And once every shred of flesh had been torn from the carcass that was Limbo of the Lost, once everyone had laughed at how hopelessly obvious the thefts were, at the general worthlessness of the game, and at the utterly silly end sequence posted on YouTube, they went after the men behind the game, the three friends, the Maidstone misdeeds. Soon, they found the quote that opens this article. Then they found even more quotes, in which Majestic Studios, as the three friends called their company, lied about how the graphics were created. And then they found the picture, the one that had been taken to an article in the local Kent Messenger newspaper before the scandal had broken. The one that shows Tim Croucher, Steve Bovis, and Lawrence Francis proudly holding up a copy of Limbo of the Lost to the camera. They look like three middle-aged sneering reality TV characters. And now people were enraged. They disgraced the gaming industry all over the UK. Burn them. Burn them. The witch hunt quickly went after those questionable individuals. The players alternated mockery, hatred, and heckling with reeling out personal information on all the Bovises, Francises, and Crouchers they could find. They bombed email accounts and doxed a completely innocent poker player whose parents happened to name him Steve Bovis. And when Majestic Studios finally issued a press release claiming that the stolen footage had been sent to them from outside sources, these online sleuths were the first to see it for what it was. Another ridiculous lie. They were the first to point out that Steve Bovis had said in interview after interview that he and his two friends had created the entire game themselves. And somewhere, it all ended. The gaming community's bloodhounds never found Majestic Studios, but they had gotten their feast, their LOLs, their quick fix, and they were happy with it. Limbo of the Lost was, after a single month in the burning spotlight, forgotten by everyone. Apart from four people. One of them was me. For two years, I've been carrying loads of questions, which can really be boiled down to one. Why? Why did they do it? The other three people are called Steve Bovis, Tim Croucher, and Lawrence Francis. And for two years, they have been carrying the answer. 
That's why I had to find them. Part 3. Swallowed by the Earth The years have passed, and the tracks have gone cold. Majestic's website is dead and buried, and when I dig it up again, I only find some dead email addresses and one last cheerful message. Limbo of the Lost is now available for pre-order. I Google Steve Bovis, pull up more email addresses, and send off messages. They bounce right back. I Google Tim Croucher and find a plumbing company in Maidstone where a man of this name is the manager. He does not respond. I Google Lawrence Francis and bring up the online voice actor for hire service where Francis has registered his resume. It's a long list. He has played a paranoid German in the PC game Limbo of the Lost, a space monster in the PC game Limbo of the Lost, a half-human, half-insect in the PC game Limbo of the Lost, and so on. If you are impressed, then you can register and thus get access to Francis's email and phone number. I am impressed. Now, I think, now. I never get a reply to that email, and the phone number is no longer in service. Weeks have passed and it feels like the three friends have disappeared, as if they were lost forever. I get desperate and start looking for anyone from Maidstone with the name Bovis, Francis, and Croucher on online networks like Facebook and LinkedIn. Messages pour out of me, only to be swallowed by silence. Presumably, the recipients are tired of being harassed with questions about limbo of the lost. I'm probably not as different from those internet sleuths as I'd like. Finally, I find 192.com. It is an English version of our Enero.se, and one would think that the matter is thus arranged. But the English aren't as public with their phone numbers as us Swedes, so I can only call one of the six people that a search for Steve Bovis Maidstone turns up. For the other five, only a single bit is served of information, with whom they share a household. And surprisingly, this is where I get the track. One of the six Steve Bovises from Maidstone lives with a woman called Lisa Highstead. I react when I read the name. I've heard it before. And then I remember. The lies. Somewhere in those interviews that preceded Limbo of the Lost, the ones where Steve Bovis lies about how they deliberately stayed away from other games, he also talks about the people who helped the three friends make the game. One of the names he mentioned is Lisa Highstead, which is therefore his partner, what I hear is the sound of pieces falling into place. 192.com tells me I can pay money to find out more about this Steve Bovis, and I can't get the credit card out fast enough. Now, I think. Now. I expect Steve Bovis's phone number, but I get something else. An address. It's a dizzying feeling. I've been looking for him for weeks, and now I know where he lives. There is even a Google Maps box on my screen where I can see his house. I zoom in as much as possible and wonder if this is as close as I'll get to that answer. There is only one thing left to do. I send letters, one for Steve Bovis and one for Lawrence Francis, whom I find the same way. That's two letters of intent that I'm sending, because right then and there, I know there is only one way to get them to respond. By making them believe they have something to gain from this. By making them remember the hate, the disappointment, the shame and convince them that a conversation with me is the antidote, the thing to make all the evil go away. I don't understand why they would choose to believe that. I don't know what reason they might have for not just ignoring me. When I see both envelopes being swallowed by the mailbox, I see my last two hopes disappear into the darkness. The only thing left is to wait. Part 4. The Far From Perfect Crime In the meantime, I'm trying to figure out who Steve Bovis is, and one thing is very clear. He really wanted to make this game. According to the interviews he gave before the scandal, Limbo of the Lost had been in development for almost two decades, but failed to be completed for any of the many operating systems it was advertised for. Around the summer of 1995, it seemed quite close. The Amiga version was shown at game conventions, and received coverage in several major gaming magazines. But despite one of these claiming to be rather optimistic for the future of this up-and-coming team, something happened, and Limbo of the Lost disappeared again. In 2002, 
Bovis apparently decided to make one last attempt, licensing the free game engine Wintermute and starting a PC version. It is on Wintermute's official forum that we find the reason why Majestic Studios felt compelled to steal from every other game. It is quite simple. They could not do it themselves. In hundreds of posts, Steve Bovis asks about everything between heaven and earth. Relatively simple things. Things that a programmer of a commercial game should know himself. Such as how to get cutscenes into the game. Or how to implement a screen showing the game's map or what file format to use for backgrounds. It's surprising that the forum members answering all these questions didn't demand royalty shares. But of the 404 forum posts that were signed S. Bovis, it is the final one that is the most interesting. It was written on June 3rd, 2008, just a week before Limbo of the Lost was thrown into purgatory, and it reads as follows. I am on the lookout for a 2D slash 3D background artist for the sequel to Limbo of the Lost. This is a percentage of royalty position for the right person. Steve Bovis would make a sequel. And this time, he was going to get someone to do real graphics. This time, he would do the right thing. This time, he would be honest. It's been a week and a half since I sent my letters, and all I hear is silence. I decide to pirate Limbo of the Lost. The American version of the game was pulled after just two days on the market, and the European version can only be bought from a website that doesn't work. So ironically, stealing is my only choice. And when I start playing, I'm very, very glad I didn't pay money for this. Even if you ignore the fact that most of it is stolen, this is still a very, very bad game. It uses a ridiculously slow, over-designed, and intimidating interface that annoys you from the very beginning. The sound mixing makes it impossible to hear what anyone is saying. The humor lacks any kind of timing. I stink. And the puzzles laugh at the concept of logic. But playing it is also the only way to truly understand how amateurish the thefts are. The hero of the adventure, Captain Benjamin Briggs, wanders around on two-dimensional images of three-dimensional games, and therefore, it is obvious how Majestic Studios managed to steal everything. They played the games, saw something they liked, pressed print screen, pasted the image into their own game, and the graphics were done. It has been two and a half weeks since I sent my letters, and with that, I could see my last shred of hope disappearing. I come to the conclusion that I, and by extension you, now know as much about Limbo of the Lost as anyone not part of Majestic Studios. And it seems that we will have to settle for that. We've had our LOLs, and we're not coming after the developers anymore. We're not as different from those internet predators as we would like. But one day, there is a letter in my mailbox. A letter that changes everything. Johan, I would be happy to meet with you and discuss my involvement in the development of Limbo of the Lost, if you can convince me that this is not just the beginning of another smear campaign. Perhaps the moment has come to tell the story from my perspective, and finally clear my name. I have been silent until now, finding no impartial channel through which to speak. Please note, however, that I have had no contact whatsoever with Steve Bovis since the events that took place in June 2008. I can be reached at the above telephone number and or email address. Sincerely, Lawrence Francis. And so, two weeks later, I'm sitting and drinking some juice in Lawrence Francis's garden. Part 5. When Everything Crashed It is June 10th, 2008, in the evening. Tomorrow, Limbo of the Lost will be released in America. Lawrence Francis who spent the last three years working day and night on the game, is finally finished. He gave up his pub for it, nearly broke down from the pressure, and had constant problems with sleep, mood, and alcohol. But now, he can finally relax and enjoy the fruits of his hard work. His partner, who supported him all those years and worked hard to let him focus on the game's development, sits at the computer nearby. She notices that he received an email, she turns towards him and asks him if he should open it. Lawrence Francis thinks that this is a night when you can get nothing but good news, 
and answers yes. And then, just like that, their lives come crashing down. The email does not contain any good news. It instead contains a question posed by Ryan Ladada, the editor of Gameplasma.com and Eric Frank's superior. It was forwarded to him by Tri Synergy. Both senders wonder the same thing. How do you explain this? And refer to two attached images. One depicts the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. The other depicts Limbo of the Lost. And there is hardly any difference between them. Lawrence Francis has no idea how to explain that. His areas of responsibility throughout development have been music, puzzle design, and scripting. The graphics were handled by Steve Bovis, the project's leading figure and driving force. So Lawrence calls him, and Steve replies that he got the background from a guy in America that he knows. And then he promises that it's just this one picture and that they can fix this. Lawrence emails his publisher and explains that it was all a misunderstanding, that it was just a single background, and that they could come up with something new, self-created, if they only had a few days. The next morning, 12 new background plagiarisms have been discovered. So Lawrence Francis calls Steve Bovis again and is met with a tidal wave of strange excuses. And as he finally begins to understand what his friend has done to him, the plagiarized images continue to pour in from all corners of the internet. The scandal just grows and grows. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. For several days, Lawrence Francis and his partner, who asked to remain anonymous, live in a strange state of shock. They describe it as how it might be when someone in one's own family has died. Eventually, they can't even talk about it anymore. Can't bring themselves to think about how the game that was their heart child for three years has now, overnight, turned into something disgusting, something ugly. That the thing they both have sacrificed so much for turned out to had been just one big lie. When Lawrence Francis calls Steve Bovis one last time, he knows this is the end. How can you live with yourself? He shouts. You failed me. You failed Tim. You failed your family. You failed every small game developer who hopes to be taken seriously. What you've done is unforgivable. I know. Steve Bovis replied. And those were the last words exchanged between two friends who had known each other for over a decade. Part 6. The Criminal of Maidstone <laughs> Lawrence Francis laughs as he tells the story. His laughter fills the small walled garden behind his quintessentially British brown brick house, drowning out the chirping of birds and the barking of the neighbor's dog. It is the one constant during the two hours we sit there in the blazing sun and talk. <laughs> he laughs at his life. He laughs because he can't do anything else. Francis has, as he himself puts it, an uncanny ability to get involved with companies that a year later go bankrupt. He's lost a lot this way. He's been a hair's breadth away from getting both novels and music albums published, but something has always gone wrong in the end. However, nothing has messed up like Limbo of the Lost. I've had doors slammed in my face many times before, but this was something else. It's as if doors were slamming shut on all sides of me, all while people started pouring garbage over my head. Francis laughs. In fact, his biggest regret is not laughing when one day, in early 2004, Steve Bovis and Tim Croucher, who were still unknown at the time, sauntered into the pilot, the pilot being his pub, which he would later give up for Limbo of the Lost. Many years earlier, he helped them with the music for the Amiga version of the game, and now he was asking them if it had made them millionaires yet. That's what we're here to talk about, Bovis replied, and then showed him pictures of the new PC version. Pictures that were so impressive that Francis almost immediately jumped on the project. Again, Bovis had drawn up a contract, the most important point of which was all material must be self-created. All three signed and thus had embarked on the path that would eventually lead them to the brink of hell and beyond. Now I found out that even that very first picture, the one that impressed me so much I jumped on the project again, was fake, apparently. So he came and asked me, poker-faced, to give up my whole life for that lie. God, 
Why didn't I just laugh them off instead? Francis has played three games in his life. The first was The Secret of Monkey Island, which came out in 1990, around the same time that Steve Bovis and Tim Croucher started working on Limbo of the Lost. It's his favorite game. The other two he has forgotten the names of, but he is certain that neither of them is on the long list of titles he is accused of copying. Still, he's disappointed that he didn't notice anything. When he thinks about it, he never saw Bovis do any actual work. During their many meetings when he planned and handed out deadlines, the machines were always just humming in the background. Once, Bovis had created all the graphics for an entire chapter in just a few days. It was the only time Francis asked. Bovis replied that it worked much like a printing press, that it takes a long time to finish the first graphic part, but then it just rolls on by itself, and Francis thought it sounded logical. Jeez, he says, and rolls his eyes. Then, the phone rings. He gets out of the plastic chair and darts away. Fingers crossed. He shouts as he disappears into the house. And as I sit there and wait, I think to myself, so there he is, dear internet. One of those criminal masterminds you hated so much. Francis looks disappointed when he returns. It was just Tim, he says. He won't meet you at the pub until half past three. Shortly after I first found Lawrence, he gave me Tim Croucher's contact details. And judging by his ecstatic emailing, this is a man who is just as eager to tell his story. It turns out there is a reason for that. I don't think Tim ever got over this, Lawrence says, and hesitates for a second before continuing. I have performed all my life and always found myself in the center of attention in some way. Tim hasn't. Limbo of the Lost was, for Tim, that big moment in his life when he was finally going to be somebody. He would make everyone proud. Himself, his father, everyone. Instead, he was crushed. Really crushed. He lost everything. In the beginning, he kept calling and repeating the same thing over and over. How could he do this to us? Lawrence would reply. Tim, it's over. You have to let it go. You have to move on. But he couldn't. And to this day, he only talks about two things, Limbo of the Lost and Steve Bovis. Francis says that Croucher was the team's driving cuckoo, that they used to make jokes at his expense, and that he often thought that Bovis went too far with the jokes. He then explains the contract that regulated what royalties would be paid to those who made up Majestic Studios. Bovis put it together, and it was based on how much work each person did. Since Bovis created all the graphics himself, of course he would get 50% of the revenue. Lawrence would get 35%. 8% would be put aside to fund the sequel. And a paltry, ridiculous, silly 7% would therefore go to Tim Croucher. It was an insult, says Francis. And I don't know why he agreed to it. But he probably felt so left out that he was willing to accept anything to be a part of this fantastic thing that was Limbo of the Lost. It was his only chance to be part of something important. His only chance to be somebody. We have been sitting there for a long time, in the little garden behind the little house in Anonymous Maidstone. At that moment, I notice that something has changed. The sun is still baking us, the birds are still chirping, and the neighbor's dog clearly hasn't given up. But Francis's laughter has died down. Poor Tim, he adds after a while, as if it needed to be said. Part 7. Tim Croucher and the Curse Before we continue, in the original article, a couple paragraphs from this section contain factual errors about historical events. In order to correct these errors, the relevant paragraphs had to be edited. The changes are significant enough that I can't in good faith call them Johann's words anymore. As such, the narration will switch to the voice you are hearing right now whenever an edited paragraph is being read. The corrections are based on these three books, and also on this documentary by the YouTuber Part-Time Explorer, which I highly recommend. I don't blame Johann for getting some facts wrong, 
since there is a lot of misinformation about this specific topic, as outlined in this book especially. Anyway, back to the story. If I never opened that book... Croucher is convinced that there is a curse to Limbo of the Lost. And when I look into his eyes, it's clear he is being serious. He truly believes in this. The book he talks about is one of many that tell the story of the ghost ship Mary Celeste, the real mystery behind the events of Limbo of the Lost. According to legend, the Mary Celeste was a haunted ship. In the spring of 1861, she sailed out across the Atlantic for the very first time, and a few days later the captain, Robert McClellan, one of the ship's owners, died of pneumonia. It was her first victim. McClellan's replacement, John Nutting Parker, first got the ship stuck in some fishing weirs and then crashed into an English brig, thus sinking it and forcing the Mary Celeste to turn back for repairs. In 1867, she was driven ashore in such a damaged state as to be initially abandoned, only to be salvaged later by a new owner. But it wasn't until December 4, 1872, that she finally managed to firmly place herself into the history books. The Mary Celeste was discovered drifting aimlessly near the coast of Portugal. She had left New York a month earlier with a crew of 10 people. This included seven highly experienced sailors, the reputable captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs, his wife, and their two-year-old daughter. When the ship was boarded, she was found completely empty. The crew's personal belongings remained, the cargo was intact, there was enough food and water on board to last them six months, and strangest of all, the ship was almost completely undamaged. But the people seemed to have vanished into thin air. They were never found, and even today their fate is one of the great mysteries of maritime history. In the years following her disappearance, the Mary Celeste changed hands multiple times, and throughout this period, she continuously caused financial losses to her owners. In January 1885, the last owner, Gilman C. Parker, crashed the ship on purpose to defraud an insurance company. Parker was put on trial for barratry, and even though he was eventually allowed to go free, he nonetheless died in poverty just three months later. No one deemed it worth salvaging the Mary Celeste, so the damaged wreck was left to eventually sink to the bottom somewhere off Haiti. But Croucher tells us that the curse may have not gone down with the ship. Instead, it continued to affect people who were in various ways intertwined with its fate. He is convinced that this long chain of horrific events stretches through history and right up to our time. And when he sat down in Bovis's bedroom and suggested they base a computer game on something he'd read about a haunted ghost ship, the curse fell upon him. And before you laugh it off, consider this. Within three months of Limbo of the Lost being released, Croucher lost the following. His house, his job, his car, his great love, and his best friend. If I never opened that book, says Croucher, if only. Part 8. All of Tim's Wounds Tim Croucher is a polite, pleasant, and rather short man and a deeply, deeply wounded one. Admittedly, he looks like any carefree, chain-smoking 47-year-old car salesman as he sits in the shadows behind the Style & Winch pub on Union Street in Maidstone. But the fact that he's hurt is so obvious that I feel like I could see the scars with the naked eye if we just moved out into the sun. He got them when his best friend suddenly planted two palms in his back and pushed him down an abyss one that he still doesn't seem to have climbed out of. And when you hear his story, it's easy to wonder why he wishes he'd never heard of the Mary Celeste, when instead, he could wish he'd never heard of Steve Bovis. 22 years and about twice as many meters from where we are sitting right now, they met for the first time. In 1988, there was a small computer store opposite of Style & Winch, and one day, they were both in it at the same time. Bovis approached Croucher and, ironically, asked if he had any pirated games for sale. Croucher responded that he didn't even know such a thing existed, but this got them to start talking about games, 
about the now-forgotten ZX Spectrum adventures like Valkyrie 17 and The Pawn. And from that moment on, they were inseparable. And after just six months, they came to the conclusion that they could do something better, something of their own. Croucher hatched the idea to start from the mystery of the Mary Celeste. Bovis started programming, and thus, the text adventure, Limbo of the Lost, was born, which they planned to release for the classic home computer, Atari ST. If they had succeeded in this, then perhaps, considering that a text-only adventure doesn't exactly need graphics, this story would have ended happily. Perhaps Tim and Steve would have been sitting here with me, side by side, in the shade behind the Style and Winch pub. Or perhaps, and much more likely, I would have never even heard of any of them. But Limbo of the Lost for Atari ST was never finished. Instead, it followed the two friends on their journey through life. It moved from one gaming platform to another, saw its creators transform from 20-year-old geeks to middle-aged men, was there in the background as they acquired jobs, relationships, and houses. And all the while was the very foundation of their friendship. But because the mortar that held that foundation together was just a sticky mess of lies, it all crumbled in the end. And then, a lot of other things broke. Tim Croucher repeats himself a lot during my conversation with him. He reiterates that he had no idea what Bovis did with the backgrounds. He reiterates that he will not spend the interview bad-mouthing the one he once called his best friend. And above all, he reiterates over and over again that he was the one who came up with the idea for the story in Limbo of the Lost. It is my story, and it will always be my story. No one can take it away from me. I can write a book based on it whenever I want, and no one can say I can't, because that's my story. It's as if the most important thing for him is to point out that he really was part of Majestic Studios, that he really was one of those behind Limbo of the Lost. He doesn't worry about people associating him with the world's most mocked game. On the contrary, he worries that everyone will forget to do it. He worries only that he will once again end up being the one to be ignored. Not all of his scars come from the day his lifelong dream turned out to be a hoax. Most seem to have happened much earlier. He got one of them around 1995, when Bovis came home from a meeting with Rasputin Software, a Birmingham-based game publisher. They agreed to publish Limbo of the Lost, and since Bovis was their contact, he was transformed overnight into the great leader of the project. Tim Croucher, the one who came up with the idea for the game, thus became an extra in the background. He got another scar when Francis jumped on the development bandwagon. It was decided that it would be best if he handled the script and puzzle construction work, which had been Tim's duties until then. Many other scars he incurred during Steve Bovis's systematic attempts to freeze him out. He used to send nasty emails where he wrote, You don't work enough. If you don't do this or that, we will fire you from the team. And sometimes I know he emailed Lawrence, suggesting they get rid of me. Other times, he did the opposite. But usually it was me who felt left out. Croucher describes Bovis as power mad. So obsessed with being in control and with Limbo of the Lost being his, that he tried to play his friends off against each other. But what makes it all seem even more ruthless is the fact that Steve had known Tim for many, many years, and he knew what the game meant to him. Everything. I just wanted to be able to point to something and say, I've done that. I just wanted to experience what it's like to walk into a store and see your game sitting there on the shelf, or see someone take it down and buy it, paying money for something that I created. I just wanted to leave something behind, something that would make people remember me after my death. Pause. Tim Croucher looks at me but doesn't seem to be actually focusing. Maybe it's the three strong beers he's had during our conversation. Maybe he's looking for something else. Maybe he's trying to look back on his life. I haven't left anything behind. Lawrence has his family, Steve too, but not me. 
My mother died when I was 22 years old, and then I had to take care of my father. So I missed out on a lot. Life, girlfriends, all that stuff. Then it was too late. He loses the topic. I'm just a very emotional person. It's not the beer that talks. I just felt very left out. And then finds it again. So I thought, if I can't leave anything behind in the form of a child, I'll at least try to do it with a game. In light of this, it is perhaps not surprising that Tim Croucher's whole life came crashing down in what he describes as the foggy months after the revelation. Maybe things didn't matter as much anymore. Maybe houses, jobs, and a 10-year-long relationship didn't matter as much when he already lost what had, somehow, become most important to him. He called it Limbo of the Lost, and he saw it as his child. Tim Croucher wants to wrap up the interview, and with that, there is only one thing left to do, one voice left to be heard, and only one way to hear it. Part 9. Steve's Home It's 6.22 p.m., and I'm standing in front of a house. It has two stories, drawn curtains, is built of brown brick, and I've seen it before. But back then, I was sitting in front of a computer screen 142 miles away and could close my Google Maps window at any time, thus leaving Steve Bovis's house to its fate. This doesn't work anymore. There is only one door standing between me and everything I traveled to Maidstone for. But now, I hesitate. I'm nervous. I'm afraid. I am a faint moment away from turning around and going back to the safe computer screen in my safe Stockholm. Bovis never responded to my intrusive letter, and suddenly I'm hit, full force, by the realization that I'm seconds away from calling a stranger one who clearly doesn't want to hear anything from me. I start walking away. I stop. I turn back again. I came to Maidstone to make a human out of Steve Bovis. I came here to tear down the player's horrible images of him and put up mirrors in their place. I wanted to say, look here, this is a human being. This is you. This is someone who was driven to do something that anyone else could have done. But as I look at that personal portrait of him in my head, one that was slowly filled in during this scorching hot day, I still don't see that human being. I just see something cold and ruthless. I only see the villain of this story. I struggle through the closed gate and slowly approach the house. He had an obsession with Limbo of the Lost, said Francis about eight hours ago. He was so obsessed with it that it was almost uncomfortable, and he loved deadlines. It was like working under a dictator. Steve is a tough guy, said Tim Croucher about three hours ago. If he has to stomp on someone, he stomps on someone. I moved my finger to the doorbell. I have an impulse to pull it back, but it's already too late. I have rung Steve Bovis. I hear footsteps. A dark outline is visible in the fogged window that forms the center of the door. My heart is pounding. The door opens, and there stands a round little woman, winking at me in surprise. It is to her credit that I am even here, in Maidstone. Her name is Lisa Bovis, once called Lisa Highstead, and she greets me with a smile. She tells me that her husband will be home from work in about two hours. Come back then, she says. Do you think he will want to talk to me? I ask. Yes, I certainly think so. Bloody hell, did you catch the devil himself? Asks Francis when I call and explain that unfortunately, I can't make it to the barbecue he's invited me to. Two hours later, I am standing in front of that house again. I walk the same steps, suffer the same agony, ring the same doorbell, and am greeted by the same face. Lisa tells me that Steve had to work overtime, 
and when she promises that he will call me tomorrow, I can almost feel him standing there, listening, hidden in the interior of the quaint brown house. I look at the slightly troubled wife in the doorway and at the curious child peeking out behind her, and I'm sure this is as close to human Steve Bovis as I'll ever get. Part 10. The Final Betrayal The next day, while I wait for that call, Lawrence and Tim take me out for a drive. We crisscross Maidstone, looking at pubs where Limbo of the Lost was planned, houses where Limbo of the Lost was developed, and, somewhat unplanned, the flat where Lawrence, quote, first impregnated a Maidstone woman, end quote. The two of them haven't seen each other since that fateful day when, quote, shit hit the fan. There's just been no reason, they said. And now, they're laughing and reminiscing together. They remember the time when they were supposed to be recording voices for the game, but Lawrence was so drunk that he accidentally tore down Steve's curtain rod instead. And the time when the three of them had a meeting, but started laughing so hard they literally couldn't stand up. And the time Steve had wrestled Lawrence down for fun, causing people to call the police and report an assault. Stop right there, criminal scum! If the world were a more beautiful place, Perhaps the central figure of these stories could be here too. But it's getting late and he doesn't call. Maybe he'll never tell you why he did it. Maybe, like the ill-fated Mary Celeste, he will take his secrets to the grave. Was it laziness? Was he so focused on his schedule that he panicked and violated his own contract to meet his own deadline? Was he just out of his mind? Who knows? Lawrence says, changing the subject. It's a curse. Limbo of the Lost never leaves you. The other day, I sat down in front of the TV to watch the quiz show with Stephen Fry, and suddenly, bam, our company's logo came out of nowhere, which he stole. He parks in front of his little house, invites us for refreshments, and rushes off to dig out something interesting. After a while, he returns with a large box filled to the brim with various papers. It contains the old contracts between the three friends, hand-drawn puzzle ideas, and an American copy of Limbo of the Lost, the version that was withdrawn after just two days and thus sells for huge sums on eBay. He makes it even more unique by signing it, then hands it to me. Consider it your pension, Johan, in case the magazine you write for goes to hell. <laughs> I should probably mention here that this article was present in the very first issue of the Fiendon magazine, and the magazine seems to have gone defunct after just two issues. So, yeah. Then suddenly, Lawrence finds the real rarity, the design document for Limbo of the Lost 2, the sequel that never got a chance to become reality, the sequel where Steve Bovis would finally do the right thing the game he wasn't going to steal together. I've never seen that, says Tim, and it feels as if the temperature in the room is dropping. No, I've never spoken about this to you, Lawrence says hesitantly. But Steve didn't want you on the sequel. I see how Croucher collapses, how Bovis, two years after they last saw each other, has managed to inflict another wound on him. I see how all those years of fear of being left out, fear of being forced to give up what he saw as his baby, are coming back to him. And Lawrence tries to laugh it all off. <laughs> laugh and laugh and laugh. And in that moment, I realize that I no longer care much about why Steve Bovis did what he did. I only care about Lawrence Francis and Tim Croucher the innocent men who suffered the consequences and are still forced to live with them, as they sit before me now, looking like two lost souls forever stuck in the claws of the curse, stuck in limbo. May I see that? Says Tim, and is handed a bundle of papers. He looks them over for a while, and then suddenly stops. Dear God, he says. What I see in his face is him finally, after all this time, 
losing the very last shred of hope and faith he had in Bovis. The man he once called his best friend. The man who he's laughed and drank with for two decades. The man who hurt him more than anyone else ever came close to doing. The man who carried one last lie. Dear God, he continues in falsetto. I wrote this. This is my story. I wrote it a bunch of years ago. He was going to steal it. He was going to actually steal it. Dear God, Steve Bovis. Dear God.